So if I could just magically snap my fingers and give you and every other player in Deep Game one ability, this might be it. <laughs> this might be it. What we're about to talk about in this talk, uh, this is one of those foundational principles that um, it's nuanced and it's subtle, but it is absolutely foundational to your success, not only as a basketball player, but as a human being in the world. And when people talk about the difference, the real difference between good and great, when uh, people speak about greatness in any capacity, whether it's in basketball or otherwise, this is that fundamental quality that creates greatness. And what I'll say right off the bat is that if you don't have this, no amount of hard work whatsoever, there is no amount of work that you could do to overcome it, okay? To overcome not having this. It is that important, okay? Now, this is gonna be a subtle distinction that we're making in this talk here, so it's gonna require some active, creative intelligence on your part, engagement with the talk and, and thinking through these things, actually making an effort to experience them. But if you get this, I, I promise you, this is one of those things that can, uh, it can actually change your life, really. It can really change your life. So I will start off with a story uh, to illustrate what I'm, uh, the principle that I wanna get across here. And this story comes from back when I was running EGT, Elite Guard Training. We used to have a camp every summer called EGT Live, and we would invite uh, 30 to 35 players, and uh, all of our coaches would come, and we'd have a week of like really, really intense basketball training where I would, every night, gather in the library with all the players and give talks like these ones. And the format that these talks took, I, I was speaking about diff, uh, different deep game principles. We called it EGTX back then. But the format that these talks took is that I would have a PowerPoint up on the screen behind me and I would click through it and I would use it sort of as a guide. There would be like images and text on the, on the PowerPoint screen. But for the most part, I would just talk off the cuff like this and use the PowerPoint as a guide. Now, because of this, I always knew, <laughs> I always knew which players in the room were understanding what I was saying and actually absorbing it and which ones weren't. And every year it, it was kind of uh, almost scary, really, how few players actually understood the things that I was saying. And the way that I could tell is that every single time I clicked through the PowerPoint and brought up a new slide, almost every head in the room would immediately drop right down into their notebook and begin copying word for word exactly what was up on the PowerPoint. Almost every head in the room. There was always one or two players though, <laughs> one or two players, I think one year there was like three, who didn't immediately drop their head. It didn't mean they weren't taking notes. They were taking notes when they felt it was necessary, but for the most part, those one, two, three players would be staring right at me, actively absorbed in what I was saying, rather than just going unconscious and mindlessly scribbling down exactly what was up on the screen. Now, I always knew <laughs> that those players who were looking right at me, absorbed in the lesson, were the ones who actually got it, and that most of the room was simply going unconscious. And this is no fault of the players, this is just the way that we've been taught to learn in society, it's the way that we've been, uh, that our school system has been set up for the most part, it's it's like rote memorization where you've, we've all had the experience, right, where you're studying for a test and you're taking in all of this information and then it seems like as soon as you drop your pen and the test is over and you submit that test, you forget everything. <laughs> and like that is kind of the way that the school system is set up. That's a big, big problem if you're, and believe it or not, that's a big problem if you're looking to be great in basketball, if you're looking to be great in the world as a whole, that is a huge problem. And the distinction that I'm making here is one between what I, what I call passive mind versus active mind, okay? This is the critical point, passive mind versus active mind. The players who are in the room who immediately dropped their head and started taking notes as soon as they saw another slide up on the screen. They were passively taking in the information that I was giving to them without putting it through a filter, a filter and a creative, intelligent process of their own. They weren't actively, their intelligence wasn't engaged in the material. They were simply passively taking it in, putting it into a notebook, and then 
most often probably forgetting about it entirely and never reading the notebook again, rather than once again, on the, on the flip side, having an active mind. Active meaning their mind is alive during the process of taking that information in. This is what I saw in the one, two, three players whose head would remain up and they'd be looking right at me, engaged in what I was saying, taking the information in. So this active versus passive mind, this is a, a really important distinction and we're gonna get into how this applies to basketball and how this applies beyond basketball even and how critical it actually is. And I promise you, this is so much more important than you think it is. So we're gonna get into that now and I'm gonna start off by defining what each of these things are. So a really simple definition is that a passive mind is a mind that relies on the thinking of others. Okay, a passive mind is a mind that relies on the thinking of others. Meaning when those players were in the room and they were scribbling down every single thing that I was saying or every single thing that they saw up on the PowerPoint without really absorbing the information that I was saying, they were passively relying on my thought, relying on the thoughts that I was, um, that I was teaching, passively just taking those in. It's sort of like taking... Um, somebody's information and just pouring it into your mind without any filter of your own. That's gonna be useless information, obviously. That's gonna be unusable. It's not gonna be, you're not gonna learn that deeply. You're not gonna understand it well enough to actually use it. It's just pour the accumulation of, of raw information, okay? It's empty calories, you know, like literally eating junk food. Regardless of whether that food is nutritious or not, it, it's like just pouring it into your digestive system without actually assimilating the nutrients. So on the flip side to that, an active mind is simply a mind that thinks for itself. When those three players uh, were staring straight at me and taking in the information, they were actively thinking for themselves. It didn't mean that they were... Um, it doesn't mean that they were teaching themselves the information. They were still learning from what was up there, but they were actively engaged in the learning process. They were thinking, um, in what way is that true? Is that true or not? How does it fit into my model of reality? How, did, how might it fit in with a situation that I was experiencing on the court earlier today? How might I practice that later on? Their mind is actively engaged creatively in that process of learning. And so once again, a passive mind is a mind that relies on the thinking of others where an active mind is a mind that thinks for itself. So just to drive this home a little bit more with a few analogies, okay? This might be the difference between the big brother and the little brother, right? We have seen like uh, if you have a brother, you know, the, the big brother is often the one who's like leading the adventures and, and getting into trouble and mischief and, and like going on all of these interesting experiences where the little brother is just blindly following him because it's his big brother and he trusts him and he admires him and so on. The big brother has this active, living, creative intelligence. And, and this is a generalization. There might be a little brother who's active and a big brother who's passive. But just for the sake of the example, and in this one, the big brother is actively like thinking through, okay, what do I want to do? And what adventure do I want to go on? The little brother is just passively following. Okay. This might be the difference between the scientist in a lab at a university who's breaking new ground, who's testing experiments and hypo making new hypotheses that haven't been tested before, and then literally uh, innovating in the field of science that they're practicing, versus the student who's in the classroom learning about what that scientist had uh, been studying and just memorizing for the test so that they that student could answer then um, you know what that scientist contributed to science right so it's the difference between a scientist in a lab and a student who's memorizing their work this might also be the difference between a wage earner and an entrepreneur right a wage earner who goes to work for somebody else not that there's anything wrong with that but uh, the wage earner is basically serving somebody else's line of thought. They're there to execute on the thinking of somebody else, whereas the entrepreneur is the one with the grand vision that their active mind has come up with. The wage earner is more passively taking a more passive role, and it's possible that a wage earner can be actively engaged in that role too, but again, just an example. The wage earner is passively following the vision of the entrepreneur who hired them. 
this uh, might even be, taking it a step further, this might be the, the difference between an entrepreneur and a true innovator, okay? There are a lot, of, a lot of entrepreneurs out there who are copying other business models, other people's ideas, repackaging them and sort of carbon copying them for themselves just for the sake of making money. They're not actually contributing anything new to humanity. They're not breaking any new ground. They're just copying somebody else's model. They may have a little bit of vision to strike out on their own and build a business, but that business is just a copy of a copy. <laughs> it's a copy of somebody else's versus the innovator who actually breaks new ground, this, you know, the Elon Musks and the Steve Jobses of the world who actually create something brand new out of thin air using their mind, their active mind, right? So this is that active mind versus passive mind. I'm gonna uh, bring in one basketball metaphor here. And uh, this is not a perfect metaphor by any means, but uh, it'll serve our purposes. You might look at Steph Curry versus Ray Allen. Ray Allen was an incredible shooter, one of the greatest shooters of all time. And in a, a spot up shooting contest, if they were just standing around the three point arc in practice, no defenders, I would guess that there would be pretty much equal. I would guess, okay, I haven't seen them match up against each other. I don't know if they ever have, but they are probably gonna shoot both of them about 90, 95%, I'm guessing. They would miss very few shots to the point where they would be almost equal. And yet, Ray Allen is about as perfect of an idea of like a spot up uh, of, of a sniper, right? Like a, a, a shooter that you wanna have on your team, a player who hits open shots, who comes off screens and hits open shots, um, who fills that role of being the shooter. He's like as good of an example of that as you could possibly get. Steph Curry is an entirely new thing, right? Like he's he doesn't fit the role of being a shooter because we've never seen another shooter like him. The shots that he takes and the way in which he takes those shots, uh, the the like spontaneous creativity of his game has never been seen before. And so it has completely revolutionized the basketball world. I'm not saying that Ray Allen has a passive mind and Steph has an active mind, but this is an example of how those things play out, right? Ray Allen was like a perfect mold of what you want a shooter to be on your team. Steph Curry was some brand new thing entirely. That is the active mind at work. And if Steph didn't have this active mind that was able to creatively see the vision of what basketball could be and the way that he could play it, you know, he would never be Steph Curry. He would have never become the player that we all know, okay? So this is the difference, the passive following somebody else's line of thought, following uh, and relying on the thinking of others versus a mind that thinks for itself and strikes out on its own and breaks new ground. Another way of looking at this, you could, uh, I've written down a series of questions um, this is just uh, another way of driving this point home. So the, the passive mind might think, did I do it right? Did I do it right? Did I do it the way that it was instructed to be done? The active mind might ask, did it work? Did it work? Okay, literally the bottom line, did it work? It doesn't matter how it was done. Did it actually produce the result that we were looking for? Three points is three points, right? Steph, if he does that shooting from 38 feet, you know, just because nobody else had ever done that before doesn't mean he can't do it. It's, did it work? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it worked for Steph. Has worked and continues working. Uh, the passive mind might ask, what should I do? What should I do? Whereas the active mind asks, why should I do it? Why should I do it? It's a critical thinking mechanism. It is filtering out the information that's coming from a teacher, from uh, somebody else's line of thinking and thinking why, critically thinking why, not just blindly saying, what should I do, tell me what to do, but why do we do it that way? And how could it be done better? Which is leading me into the next question. Uh, the passive mind might ask, how is it done? How is it done? How has it been done in the past? The active mind, asks, how could it be done better? Again, the Ray Allen versus Steph Curry, right? So <laughs> why is this important? Why, why are we even talking about this in the first place? And um, 
<laughs> this is where it gets really, really uh, critical for you, okay? What we're gonna do first, however, is take a break. And this is something we don't normally do in these talks, but we're gonna take a break uh, for a few different reasons. The first one being we're gonna go uh, many layers deeper into this material, and I wanna make sure that you're um, that you can stay present with it, that you can actually take an active stance with your mind with this material rather than just passively taking it in. Um, this is something we do during our deep game uh, program itself. Every 10 to 15 minutes or so we take breaks. And so what I'll invite you to do now is just pause the recording, pause the talk, pause the podcast, whatever form it's taking, and uh, shake out your body. So open up your body, shake yourself out, stand up, stretch a little bit, get a drink of water if you need to, no more than about two minutes or so. And uh, you know, you don't have to, um, well, I will say don't take a long break. Like this is a, a real quick, just reset yourself, um, get your body moving a little bit and then come right back to this talk and we will go a step deeper and get into why is this important and then how do you practice it, okay? Which is really where the rubber meets the road. So pause it now and I will see you on the other side. Hey, it's Taylor. I hope you enjoyed this clip. And if you'd like to watch the full length talk, we'll have the title and or link for you in the description so that you can check it out there. And as always, if you'd like to go even deeper, the best place to do that is in our free masterclass over at deepgame.com, which I believe will be the most powerful hour of basketball learning of your life. I hope we see you there.